All right, I guess we should get started then. So again, welcome to how to navigate fundraising as an LBD, LBGTQ plus underrepresented founder. And uh, my name is Cindy Lamar. I am a member of the Start Out Programming Board in San Francisco. I am moderating this talk. I've moderated other talks for Start Out. I love talking to people, as you find out. And um, what do I do here? I co-chair the San Francisco board. I'm also a leadership coach and instructional designer. And today we have with us, if you could move the slide along. Um, before that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Start Out. So Start Out accelerates the growth of LGBTQ plus community to drive its economic empowerment, build a world where every entrepreneur has equal access to lead, succeed, and shape the workforce of the future. And we're really about supporting our LGBTQ plus entrepreneurs, um, because as you know, uh, oftentimes we're underrepresented. And um, But these uh, three founders that we have here today are helping to change that, and as are many others. Um, we have a growth lab, an accelerator program. We um, offer one-to-one -one mentoring. We have a network of 300 plus investors looking for investment opportunities on our portal. If you'd like to know a lot more about Start Out, visit startout.org. Um, we have millions of social media impressions to inspire entrepreneurs from all over the world. These are some of our sponsors. Um, they help us with our with the operation of Start Out, but also the programming. We have four signature events throughout the year and many other smaller. Uh, virtual events, and we've started going back in person this year, so we're super excited. So if you live in a city where we do offer in-person events, you're welcome to join us. Um, you don't have to join anything. They're free, and um, they're a lot of fun and really help to support the community, and they are usually learning opportunities, too. And I'd like to invite Lara from Transparent Collective to tell us a bit more about why we're doing this event and what she does there. Thank you so much, Cindy. Hi, I'm Laura and I'm the program director of Transparent Collective. We're so excited to partner with Start Out, such an aligned organization. Uh, Transparent Collective, we're also a nonprofit. We help Black, Latinx, and women founders access uh, the resources and connections they need to build successful tech companies. Um, our mission is to prepare underrepresented founders to fundraise, connect investors to high caliber entrepreneurs and founders to the right investors, as well as contribute to the development of an ecosystem where underrepresented founders um, flourish. And we mainly do this through our programming that we run quarterly. Uh, we don't take any equity. We don't charge for our programs. Similarly, we do it with the help of uh, sponsors and partners. Um, and that programming really is focused around key areas of preparing founders for pitching, um, providing products and strategy coaching, the connection of investors to entrepreneurs, and connect cultivating a powerful network for these entrepreneurs and so far we've been around for six years and we've had a significant impact um, we've had 70 founders go through our program um, and they've gone on to raise 85 million dollars um, in funding so far from some pretty um, awesome venture capital firms so we're really excited about um, the progress so far and hope um, if uh, it aligns with uh, your startup, you'll check us out and be one of the next founders to go through our program. Um, here are some of the founders that have gone through the TC program so far. Uh, we have 58% of our founders are women founders, 61% Black, 15% Latinx, and 66% headquartered outside of California, so trying to change the demographics of who is getting fundraising. Thank you. 
Thank you, Laura. And uh, wow, your program sounds wildly successful. So as you can see, there are resources out there for founders um, at every stage of your development. And uh, now I would like to turn our attention to our event speakers. We have with us today, Brian Pearson, the founder of EduRain, Andrea Barica, CEO and founder of Old School, and Mariah Barber, founder of Invisible Strengths. And they will each tell you a little bit more about themselves and their businesses, and you'll learn much more about their journey as entrepreneurs. And with that, we will close out our um, slideshow and we will jump into the discussion. So hi, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, let you do a brief introduction, uh, and then we will jump into the questions that we have. So, uh, Brian, if you don't mind kicking us off, tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, what you're doing these days. Yeah, uh, so my name is uh, uh, Brian Pearson, and uh, I'm the founder of EDU Rain. Um, EDU oh, Rain, sorry. <laughs> no, you're, you're fine. Um, EDU <laughs> Rain is an off-campus housing marketplace and financial empowerment tool. Landlords can list with us or on the college's white label website that we build out um, and they pay us and we're like similar to apartments.com. Um, we also add credit building automatically to students leases. So they build credit paying for an owner off campus for free. We have a renter's insurance partner and a, a tenant background check partner as well. Um, we have two college partnerships and over 250 listings and we start, stood up our off campus housing platform in January of 2022. Thank you. So EDU Rain. Uh, I mean, think back to your college days, folks. Could you have used a little bit of help with housing? I know I could have. <laughs> uh, right. Everybody could. So um, I think you're you're really onto something and I'm sure you are uh, providing a great service. So let's go next with uh, Andrea. Andrea, tell us a little bit more about uh, yourself and uh, what you're up to. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrea. I started my career actually 12 years ago building B2B accounting software. So I'm, you know, I'm Filipino American, never really saw myself in entrepreneurship, got pulled completely into that by surprise. Uh, so, so started with accounting software, then went on. Um, I was venture partner at 500 Global, got to lead deals out of our accelerator program. So I spent a little bit of time on the other side of the table. And now I run a a global sexual wellness education platform called O School, and we build science-based, judgment-free sexual and you know sex sexuality and relationship uh, education online. And we just launched uh, a kayak.com like um, e-commerce function like a few days ago. So that's what I'm up to. Oh, okay. I love it. She says I was a surprise entrepreneur the first time around, <laughs> but I think there was a lot of intention with O School. So if you haven't checked that out. Check it out. All right. And Mariah, tell us uh, a little bit more about yourself and what you're doing. Hello, everyone. My name is Mariah Barber, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Invisible Strengths. And we are building a platform that's going to bring us into the future of work. Uh, we're more inclusive LinkedIn, where you can actually search for jobs based on accommodations. Um, a lot of folks may not be aware, but one in four people have a chronic condition or disability and it's invisible. Um, so we believe that's an invisible strip that businesses can leverage to actually um, build in the gaps uh, within their current teams. We are standing up our MVP with our 10 um, equity-focused organizations at the end of October. So really happy to be here and um, just connections to other panelists. Um, tried to do a lot of work uh, in my serial entrepreneurship journey um, with being a sexual health educator at one point. My master's is in public health and also uh, focused in real estate and wholesaling for a little bit. So excited to see where the conversation goes and uh, can't wait to get it started. So am I. So am I. All right. Well, we're going to kick it off with our first question, and I'm going to ask Andrea, what resources have you found to overcome raising funds as an underrepresented person? For me, deep relationships were the thing. Like, I think uh, the standard advice of you should just quit your job and like go and start your dream. I didn't do that at all. I always had a job. <laughs> of that paid my salary when I started companies because I don't come from money. I come from a immigrant Filipino American family. And so that was just 
not the thing. My family asked me for money, not the other way around. Uh, and so the deep relationships I built. So before I raised money for my own company, I worked for seven years for some of the smartest people I knew and all of them were my first. So that's a long winded way of saying like, yes, I read blogs. Yes, there were things online, but you just can't, you can't speed up deep relationships. Like what I always tell people is social capital, like meaning the ref, the, the people who will make introductions for you, that's kind of rarer than literal money capital, right? And so you when you're putting your reputation on the line for someone, and even now when I make introductions, it's very, you know, it's really based on relationship. And so those deep friendships, those like, and I'm not talking like we met at a networking event and we are connected on LinkedIn, but people I have bled for, worked for, you know, really doing that for me. I mean, I, I spent almost a decade uh, planting those seeds. And then when I started O School, um, I, I, I called on all these folks and that was the first round of funding. And, and by the way, I was still working a full-time job until I closed the funding because, you know, as underrepresented, you know, people coming from different backgrounds, we don't, you know, capital is really hard to come by and risk is a different calculus for us. And so um, I will say that, 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 that from terms of resources, yes, I, I would love to hear what everyone else used, but for me, I, I, I think fundraising is a team sport and I had 20 to 30 people helping me in every fundraise that I embarked on. Wow. And I see some nods of agreement with either of you like to, to, piggyback off of that or, or add to it? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, um, you know, I've, I've raised $160,000, but I still wait tables. Like if that money go back to my employees, and, you know, these partnerships and stuff are falling now. These customers are falling in the right way now. But, you know, I, I got to be stable no matter what. And that mean, and you know what, honestly, like, you know, I stopped waiting tables and I took a job and I have a degree in political science. I became the director of college outreach for four months this year. You know, you know, the hustle got to be in line, right? Um, and then, uh, <laughs> and when I, I realized uh, I was the head of college outreach for the U.S. Senate race in Missouri, and um, my engagement rates went down uh, on my uh, for ED Rain. And what I didn't realize is, you know, a lot of our early users was people getting flyers in my cards from being. Uh, patrons of the restaurant I was a waiter at. And, and that grassroots organizing was spreading my name across college uh, campuses and professors and parents. And, you know, uh, it's much, it's easier to talk to somebody as their waiter than as a director of college outreach on a, on a political race. <laughs> so like, um, so, yeah, it, it's, uh, which is, I did not think that was gonna be the case. <laughs> Uh, you know, look, that that's 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 how I've kind of grown. You know, it's just, it's being this guy everywhere, the guy everywhere, a smiling face uh, and a smiling, uh, very passionate, but also the man that will do the follow up. You know, every time I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. And then mm -hmm. and then, you know, that that creates a level of uh, accountability that you want to interact with. You want to be around accountable people. For sure, for sure. We, oh yes, Mariah, would you like to uh, add to this? Yes, um, I want to say plus one. I don't want to be too tech bro -y because we're <laughs> real here on this panel. We're, we're really talking that talk, um, but it's so refreshing to just hear the reality. I am um, in, in Washington, DC and we're having Congressional Black Caucus Week here. And a lot of people may not think that's like a prime space for startup. But for me, you know, my startup focuses on organizations that are working on health equity. So I've been going to like a lot of climate talks, a lot of reparations talks around entrepreneurship and networking there um, and building that into a funnel. So exactly what you're saying. Um, I would also just add um, that a lot of times, you know, there are these held maker stories where it's like, oh, I quit my job and did this. But again, we're talking about being underrepresented. I'm also standing here as a disabled founder and as a non-binary queer founder. And sometimes, you know, you may not have that support from family. You may have different um, accessibility needs that you have to have met, meet, met, excuse me. Or um, we don't always often talk about this, but when you quit your job and are full-time entrepreneurship, as a disabled person, you need to find out where your insurance 
where your medications, if you're someone who has a chronic condition, you need those supports in place. So I always like to uplift that because I had to think when I left my job, I've been doing this full time for a year. How am I going to have the medications I need? How, if I do need another eye surgery, how am I going to fund that? And so really being able to scenario plan. Um, I think one huge thing, just echoing again, the social capital. Um, whether I, I had a career where I was working in radio, podcasting, also worked in public health on the federal space. And I can't tell you how many times I reached out to other people. They were now in the entrepreneurship space where they knew somebody who was an investor or they had a podcast or radio show or were now at ABC and they were willing to do some coverage on my startup. So it's not always that capital that comes first, especially when you look like us. Um, but there are other things you can leverage to get there. Uh, the last thing I'll say is a lot of people want to network up, which is really important, but make sure there are levels to it that you're doing. So an entrepreneur that's maybe a year and a half ahead of you can offer you so much more than maybe somebody who you know, has exited their third company. And not to say they don't have so much wisdom to share, but that person who's a few steps ahead of you is they've got those breadcrumbs you need right now to get you mm. that next level of traction or to get you to next year, get you to that next series that you're trying to get to. So also I'll say, I hear a lot of wisdom on this panel and I already know we're doing this, but don't forget that you're also a mentor, regardless of where you're at in this space and the knowledge you have, throw it back. You know, don't reach these ropes up, throw it back to community coming behind you. Because those folks with the napkin, even I have imposter syndrome a lot. I haven't finished my um, pre-seed round. And I'm happy to be here just to talk about what it's like trying to do that in real time. And I'm still a little bit further ahead than someone else who may be trying to also figure out what this roadmap looks like for them. Yes, yes. Um, one quick question. So we had a question from the audience, and I think you might be able to kind of piggyback off of that. Martha asks, how do you initiate those relationships? And I think, Brian, you kind of talked to it a little bit, like you're waiting tables, you just start talking to people, right? You're putting your flyers out, old school flyers, but they get people's attention, right? So anything about initiating those relationships that you are building over time and um, anything specific to like the beginning of those relationships that you want to add? Yeah, I would just say like the relationships, um, you just got to put yourself out there. Um, what, my mentor through Start Out and, and make sure you have like uh, also just a, an array of mentors in different spaces at different levels. Um, but all of them have told me in their own way, if you go into a coffee shop and the person behind you doesn't know about your startup, what are you doing? And that's, <laughs> that's extreme. Like, you know, there's a place in time, but as um, you know, we're talking about on the panel, you just never know. I literally started um, a conversation yesterday over a Telfar bag. Cause I was like, oh, you got your Telfar, you know, and then found out that this person was a, a CEO of an organization that we are now finalizing a letter of intent with. You just mm -hmm. never know what that entry point will be. And don't be afraid if it is a different industry or if you met them at a different place to circle back. The last piece I'll say is start those relationships before you need anything. Don't come, you know, and let it, or let it go cold. You know, keep it warm. Just, you know, you can always chat with someone for 15 minutes just to see how they're doing, touch base before you're even asking for that capital. And then when you do have that ask, there's already that rapport established over the years or over the months. Um, and if you know that you're eventually trying to do VC at Series A, start, I say start talking to them as early as possible. Start giving consistent updates. You know, you do want to be professional and consistent with those things. But yeah. even if it's just once a year, just to let them know, hey, we're still here. Here's where we're at now. And now they can see your growth through time. Mm hmm you know, it's funny because that kind of leads us to a next question, which is how can you build deep relationships that are not strictly transactional? So what are some of the things that you do that prevent it from being like, you know, hey, could you give me $500,000 or whatever? You know what I mean? I got, yeah. I got you on that. So like, okay. for example, like, like I mentor high school entrepreneurs um, through this program. And like, you know, it's really self-serving for me, though. Here's why. I really do not care about these kids winning this pitch competition. What I care about is teaching them how to think about solving problems. 
creating stakeholder maps, understanding customer discovery, and doing the smallest thing they can to be able to get money in the door for their startup business that they have. And then through that, then I leave them for about a year or two. I, I make sure I get them on LinkedIn. And then I try to hire them to work for ED Rain. You know what I mean? Like, so I yeah. give them that thought process of how to think. And then when they get to college, I already got that seed. I've gave them free help. I taught them how to make money. I taught them how to become their own person. And then I'm like, hey, ED Rand's a little further along. I can give you some money. You, we can work together again. You can be with your cohort, you know, and that's, and that's one way, you know, like, you know, and they, they don't have to take the job. They don't, right. but it's a, a job that's available to them. I've already, you know, they already have the entrepreneurial spirit. And that's one way that I've been able to do that. Hey, anybody else? Yeah. So my strategy is a little more straightforward. I work for people. <laughs> like, I think the, like one of the easiest way to get what you want is to help other people get what they want. That's I, I, I coached. I, I, for, you have to know your superpower. I think people have to see you in the element that makes you truly awesome. And you have to know what that is. And for mm-hmm. me, it was, I was, I'm a closer. So I started my career, you know, in my startup, my first company. So I'm a second time founder, but a first time CEO. So the first time I was a founder, I was the C, I was the founder that did everything. And I think that's a great advice for people who haven't fundraised. Like you get on a star team, like that made my, that made everything for me. And I put in a lot of, you know, uh, labor. <laughs> uh, and I think yep. this is an important one for underrepresented founders because, um, unpaid labor and investment look really eerily the same. And sometimes it's hard to tell them apart. Right. And, and I think that's one thing that I, um, mentor people on and that I gave a lot before I, I took, you put, you, you invest a lot, you plant a lot. And so for me, it was all those meetings that I took to help people with their sales plans. And all those meetings I took ended up t- years later harvesting, but you don't know, you, you can't, it's not like a very direct ROI. You can't calculate, oh, if I do this many meetings, this much money will come out at the end. You have to truly give right. your heart and just trust the universe will like, it'll, it'll work itself out later, but it, it does feel, you know, at the time that you're going to be putting a lot of time in. And that, that, that was seven years for me of, of depositing that into the ecosystem and letting people see me in my element, because when people are thinking of giving you money, they're like, can this person really shine? And so people have to see you in your element. So public speaking, working for people, like putting yourself out there to consult, to coach, to help, like all the different people, because the people who you need things from need things from you, probably that's, that's typically. And so in like Mariah's totally right. Like you're going to give before you get, it's going to see, it's going to feel right. Like, why am yeah. I doing all this? So you have to kind of, it has to come from a, a place of like, this is about building a long-term ecosystem of relationships and then like just deep friendship. Like I, 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 I really mean it like initiating uh, relationships looks like having coffees and like talking about your personal life and like really getting to know people and, and let them getting to know you. And then that moment you where, whenever that day comes where you're like, Hey, I'm starting my next thing. Sometimes you don't even have to ask. They're just like, I'm ready. I've been waiting to help you. Like, let me help. Um, but that doesn't come if you're not, you know, really getting to know people. Deep. And, and, and when I say that it, it's a lot of investment, I probably spend 10 to 12 hours every single week watering friendship. I tell people that that's work mm. for me. Like, that's mm-hmm. not like that's, that's work <laughs> because when I go out and I need something, I'm going to need them. I'm going to call a lot of people. And so that, that, that is part of, for me, work. Right. And there's a saying that something like um, people don't remember everything you said, but they remember how you make them feel. And I think that's really true. And also just the act of giving sometimes really feels good. Not not if you give too much or too often and you're not getting anything in return. But there's something I think something about the energy exchange of giving that also gives something back to you. I think. Okay, so let's move on to some more questions. Um, Mariah, do you have any advice for learning the lingo of fundraising? Oh, man. Um, (laughs) Like the first thing I tell to to people, I I love us talking about uh, partnering with schools. I also have gotten into that hack of teaching design thinking, partnering with schools and just getting students to come back. And the first thing I tell them when they're like, thinking about an entrepreneur, what's a startup? I'm like, get into therapy and also like have your self-care routine, um, have your structure in place. But 
as we talked about, or the last panelist just said, this is a commitment. This is not a quick turnaround um, or like, you know, just something that uh, you'll start to pick up on tomorrow. Um, I really, when I think about it, started learning the lingo three years ago. And I know it's a little bit um, cliche now, but truly Arlen Hamilton's um, It's About Damn Time book changed my life. Um, and from there, I had never known what VC was. And I think what was really big on that is just learning that this was like a queer black woman who also had worked in like the entertainment space and made that transition. And though she was so focused on VC, that led me to a treasure trove of other podcasts. I started to, um, I'll just share a few other ones that were helpful for me. Um, Gimlet Media has a podcast called Startup where they talk about literally creating Gimlet. And although I will say a lot of the tools and resources are from the lens of sometimes straight white cis men that are very able-bodied, just learning those terms is, is great. I also did venture deals with tech stars and did many accelerators and incubators. But a big thing where you don't even need to apply, you don't need to get into anything, is join Start Out. You know, join a local uh, Facebook group around this stuff. Um, just start, everyone could get a library card. I literally would just search, literally, like search the DC database, entrepreneurship, start out, and venture. And I, I've read almost every book that they had on like audio book, because at the time, at one point, I couldn't even really see that well, because I was recovering from my eye search. But there, don't let anything be your barrier. There are a lot of YouTubes and webinars like this one's going to be saved on YouTube where you can just listen in and eventually it does start to click. You start to understand what safe note means, what series A means, what precede versus seed, and even that there's nuance in these terms for what some people consider seed versus what some people consider precede. Um, so it is important to just always look at different sources, subscribe to those newsletters. And especially if you're underrepresented, find out about like 1863 ventures and just other even smaller ventures that are getting started and just find out what they're what they're into. Uh, the only other things I would shout out is, I know before I ever even had my idea together, I started sitting in on um, meetings with other startup founders. And I just wanted to hear like their process. Um, and that really helped me to understand some terms like even design thinking. You know, as a CEO in a leadership position at all in a um, startup, you're going to have to manage folks who are engineers, folks who are developers, folks who are doing UX, UI design. And so I had to also sometimes learn that language. What is an API? What does the front end and back end look like so that when you're having these conversations, you actually understand what's going on? Um, and so it doesn't all happen overnight, but I think especially being in tech, we all know that like your new information comes out every minute, right? And so that's also affirming for me because you never should feel imposter syndrome. Someone who's been doing this 30 years still doesn't understand DAO because it's very new. So also register to free conferences if there's a startup ecosystem in your state or if there's an opportunity for you to do virtual things. Just go to even things you're intimidated by and not interested in, because I can't tell you how many times I've been able to click about some topic area, even if I'm not in FinTech, that I can bring to HR tech, which is what I'm actually doing. Hey, so there's a wealth of information out there is it in conclusion, right? And it's up to you to, to be active, proactive, ask questions, listen, 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 show up places where people are talking about these things, whether it's live podcasts, events. And, and as someone else said earlier, like you have to put yourself out there. Don't be shy. Don't be ashamed. No matter what stage you're at, Somebody has just gone through it or is going to go through it. Um, and I see uh, some courses are coming up in the chat. So keep your eyes on the chat, people. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, before we I, move I on? just want to say mm -hmm. this. Look, look, this this $160,000 raise, 70% of his angel investment, all, but the rest of that is some little grants and stuff like that. We got to do educational programs like that, that 500, 1500 here with them grants. Look, let me tell you something. My internships, it's like 2000 a semester. So like, look, I do that little class and they teach you and I got somebody for a whole semester doing work at 10, 15 hours a week. Look, and I'm, and I'm telling you, and it's a, it's a valuable internship because most, we found out 
like our internships are highly competitive because most internships at the age uh, range that we're hiring people at is getting people coffee. I actually have in like, and since people like to like mm. mentor and advise black startups and, but don't like to give money. Now this kid, they got this 10, 15 hour week internship. Got all of a sudden somebody that built this giant company, giving them advice once a week on a, on a job like that's, mm-hmm. and, and lighting a, and writing a letter of recommendation for them so they can get that, that next job. Look, let me tell you something. Look, the people who work at ED Rand as interns, our first ever marketing intern is a strategist at IBM. Our second ever marketing intern is a strategist at Citibank. Our third ever marketing intern is a, is a consultant at Maryville Consultant. And on the software side, our first ever software engineer is a software engineer at Amazon. Our second ever software engineer is a software engineer at, uh, at U.S. Bank. Our third ever software engineer is an engineer at Meta right now. So, like, you wow. know, like bringing these internships from these small little dollar programs that taught me how to be an entrepreneur, I'm still trying to do that. I just got rejected. From this like two thousand dollar grant, man, like, Brian, you too far. You can't be keep. You can't keep doing this. I'm like, why not? <laughs> <laughs> why not? This is moving me along. That is Thanks. three months worth of work of somebody helping me out and give me a face on campus. You know, Thanks. like ED rent is supposed to be for students by students. Every time I get this two three thousand dollars, I get another face on campus that advances our product and user case studies. That's it, bit by bit, folks. Right. Bit by bit and give real internships, you know, don't don't just have people bringing you coffee. All right. So um, I love this one here. How did you find opportunities to pitch? How do you refine your pitch to be more successful? Anybody? To, yeah, I'm happy to jump in this one. Uh, okay. So I was, I was 500 Global's pitch coach over many, many batches of companies and pitching is, it's, it's a lot. So at the heart of it, it's storytelling, but at the heart of it, of the heart, it's really understanding what's special about your company. And that is harder than it sounds. People go online. What do they, what do you do when you have to pitch something? You go online, you're like pitch template. And then you like pull up a, you know, like a template and pitch. And uh, I, 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 when I've written about the subject, I always talk about like, that's actually not where I start. I always start with what's what's your company in 60 seconds and can you really nail that? And I would have people, multiple time founders, multiple hundred million dollar ups, uh, you know, uh, exits, not be able to really do that well. Like some, it's really difficult to do, to do it quickly. And so when, what I usually do is that 60 second test with, with folks with your, I do this. Find the three most pessimistic and cynical people you know who know what you're talking about. That's where I start because the people who love everything you say, they're not going to really help. They're going to be like, sounds great. Totally get it. Like you, you want to have those people that you can call who you know are going to be like, what? Like that's, no, what about this? And then you, you keep refining it until that person's like, all right, that makes sense. There, that's it. There's a nugget there. And then you build the pitch around that nugget. That's that, That's all of my pitch coaching for the last like, seven or eight years um, in a nutshell. And um, there's a question, Cindy, I'm gonna, I'm reading it in the Q and A about oh, yeah. pitch competitions or at least yeah. do them yeah, yeah. because th- th- they're very cynical people on panel, ju- like on judging panels and that feedback is a gift and you have usually have to pay for it. So when you get it in the wild, like really cherish it because when someone really doesn't care about you they'll just say good job. But if someone actually cares, they're going to sit and start telling you what you're saying is wrong. Because I can tell you, like, it takes way more effort and thoughtfulness to give you critical feedback about what underlying assumptions are wrong. What objections are you just not baking in? What about your overall market? Do you really not understand? The three things that I find people mess up in their pitch is differentiation, being able to really nail that, how it becomes a massive business. Like, whose lunch do you eat? if you succeed, like your larger market. So the, the biggest thing about pitching that I think people don't get is you're not pitching your customers when you're pitching investors, you're selling your business. And so how do you sell a business? You sell it in a larger ecosystem play and that's like really difficult to do. You have to be such an expert at what you do. And then my last thing is you gotta know what's, what advice and what feedback you're getting are good and bad. And that takes so much time. 
meaning like you're going to get a million pieces of feedback, but some of it's really <laughs> bad and some of it's really good. So my advice is <laughs> my advice is to start discerning and to write down the feedback and find someone smarter who will be like, that's a, that is not smart feedback. That is good feedback. Cause that's also hard to discern. And not, just because someone is smart doesn't mean that their feedback's necessarily good. For example, I've built B2B accounting software that's scaled to like a very fairly large company. And I am like the worst person to pitch anything in the accounting B2B space because I'm jaded. So like you need, so, so just because I'm like a B2B accounting software, I'll tell everyone, don't start that company. That, that's going to like ruin your life. Right? And so uh, it doesn't always mean that the people, so, so it's good to get their like nuggets, but like it, be very wary. It's one of the hardest things, it's actually a very, very profound question, but I'll let uh, Brian and Mariah give their takes, but um, this is something that I, I, I think about all the time. Yeah, I absolutely love everything that you shared. Um, it's crazy, this synergy that was going on, because I literally wrote discernment. Yeah, it's so <laughs> um, key to everything. Yes, it is, and intentionality, um, alignment, so really looking at, I just did a pitch competition last week. So I'm fresh off of this, the jading uh, for better or worse. But um, I, I have a unique um, way that I came into pitching. So I do want to just share that. Um, for 20 years, I've been a poet and a spoken word poet. Right now, I'm actually the 20th woman of the world poet. And so basically, there are poetry, there's poetry slam competitions that I've been doing for the last 10 years. And with poetry slam, you have three minutes, two minutes, and one minute poems in those competitions. And this is for cash prizes. I started in undergrad and continued um, as an adult on like New York slam teams and also DC slam teams. So if you go over even a minute or a second time, excuse me, they start to deduct points from you. And I'm talking about a minute equals 10 points. So I, I was used to having to be an orator and get my messages across, though they were um, stories you know, of my poetry. Um, I also had to do group poems, which you have to time when you're doing different movements and stuff with folks. So I felt like I had an unfelt fair advantage when it came to pitching. Now, with that being said, um, it was just highlighted by the last panelist. When I first started pitching, I was all heart. You know, a lot of poetry doesn't have to have, you know, the Tam, Sam, and Sam in it. It doesn't have to have a, a lot of statistics and go-to-market strategy. So just finding a way to still have the heart get to that quickly in the 30 seconds, and then go to the other elements that de-risk the business, right? Um, and really understanding, as you just said beautifully, you're my, I'm doing a marketplace. So we're not pitching to the non-paying customers, which are the job um, seekers. We're pitching to the businesses that are gonna be B2B with our software. Sorry, B2B. We're still here, we're, we're jaded, but not too much apparently. But um, yeah, so, so figuring out that this needs to get to the heart of them. This needs to communicate how it's going to save them money and provide them ROI. And you know, if you're in a different competition that is for a, a different lens of person, maybe you tailor that pitch by just changing a few slides, but also understanding the different decks, decks that are accompanied by a recording of you speaking, decks that are just to send to investors, you know, those, those may be different decks, um, decks that you're using in person. So I don't want to get too much into the weeds, but you really just have to get out there and start getting that experience, start recording yourself and getting trusted advisors to give feedback. And again, go back to the discernment, really using the feedback from folks that have an intention and care with what you're trying to produce. And when you start to hear these same patterns, um, that's when you really need to address these things. Take advantage of the programs lastly. If you're in a program that's able to redo your debt, give it a facelift and give your feedback, use that. So uh, for for me, like I'm still I'm still working on my pitch all the time. Look, I got it printed out. I went to a pitch, <laughs> I went to a pitch workshop before, like two hours ago. Um, and it's because like the way I built ED Rain, people was laughing at me in the beginning. Brian, you don't know nothing about running a college, you don't know nothing. You ain't you know, you black, gay, you this ex-foster kid. Ain't nobody going to trust you. And, you know, I was like, okay, who is that person they do trust? How do I become that person? And then, you know, so I started investing in what who that person was. And then I became that person. And, you know, and, like, I'm still on that journey of becoming that person. I think in becoming that person, I'm going to become super successful. And, like, as I've recruited a team of folks around me, 
to work with me, I've stayed in programs that is like, okay, let's go back to your business model canvas. Okay, let's go back to your five minute pitch, to your two minute pitch, your one minute pitch, until I started picking up more customers and more users and more and, and I, the right co-founders and the right makeup and understanding contracts and understanding vested periods and 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 you know and now I'm like okay all right, I need to get out of these programs because now I got customers falling uh, I got customers coming to me and I got partnerships happening and I gotta make more business work and I gotta just keep growing that and now I'm on another level and I'm at another stage and I'm like okay I need another level of help now now that we have over 10 now we have hundreds of we got a marketplace and we have to solve the chicken and egg problem I got a co-founder that thought about how to do that. And now we have that, you know. So you know, it it it's it's a it's a it's an ever you know it's a journey that's ever evolving, never changing. As you go from users to monetization, as you go to product uh, uh, product site different product cycles, as as you bring in different partners, you know, we got this one man from Score who was like, "Oh, this ain't never gonna work." Blah blah blah, you know. <laughs> and and I was like, you know, and everybody on my team was like, "Brian, don't talk to this man." He crazy. He mad. He mean. I'm like, I'm like, no. Nah, I want to know why. I'm gonna keep coming back to this man. I'm gonna keep, I want to know what he see and why. Tell me. Tell me it's not. And then, it, and then and as he kind of broke down to himself, he started. He was like, dang, this is actually a good idea. And I was like, ah, ah. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not scared of no denial. Like the most we gonna, the most we gonna find out is the facts. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes people don't want to. People don't want to. Uh, people don't want to like listen to the facts that's happening in your business, right? Like people don't. You have to listen to the facts, right? And then, and just because there are certain facts for a certain thing, does not mean that all the same people are going to have the same facts, right? Then you start looking at market segments and different kinds of people, and then you're looking at okay, what kind of people I can target that have that same problem? And so, like that, you know, that's kind of I've, I've kind of done it. I've worked yeah. with folks around me, and I've understand. Uh, what what needs that I have and how I can put myself in the right position to be able to win. Awesome. And I, I think, you know, um, you, you, I love this because you all keep kind of leading me to the next question. So the next question I'd like to ask is um, how has building a team helped you to raise funds to move your business forward? How did you build the right team? Because a lot of you have talked about the people who have helped you or the people who are you're actually building this company with that you're doing right now so how um how is the team uh, an integral part of what you're doing and why are they so important yeah um the i started this as a solo founder and so i'm so grateful for my team now (laughs) um i actually have known my co-founder pretty much my whole life we've known each other since we were four years old and um we yeah and not a lot of people can say that. I'm like, if we need to de-risk this, this co-founder relationship, we're, we're in this for life. But um, we both have been serial entrepreneurs. We previously had small businesses, but she is really a chief operations officer through and through. So she had two other businesses that were grossing six figures where she just was doing project management, building systems for HBCUs and other types of businesses. So she came in. She was like, all right, you know all these people in your Rolodex, but like we need to organize them in a system. She came in and leveraged the partnership she had with HBCUs so that we could partner with Bowie State. We could partner with North Carolina a t to bring on their engineering students as apprentices and interns um, and get them paid through the school. Um, I also was able to uh, bring on like a fractional CTO that has led design sprints and was an instructor at different design schools. And she was able to build um, our early on wireframes, you know, user personas, all of these different elements through lessons um, and sprints she was doing with her students. So it's really been invaluable, the flow that they brought in. Uh, I would also just lastly add that they all brought in different elements so that when I did get to talk about my team, which was all them at one time, Um, I was able to just say, hey, I have a team of Shiro's. We have over 60 years experience across la, la, la. And then was able to leverage that into getting more outside investment. Um, Sometimes they also may have just seen like grant opportunities that we applied for and got that just didn't come across my desk because I was subscribed to a different type of newsletter. 
So the list goes on, but I would say mainly when it comes to my co-founder, her being more in the ed world, um, being able to build those partnerships for us to bring on consultants um, and just build that pipeline of, as we talked about earlier, students who have gone on to Xerox and all these different places and still come back and, and lead sprints, hackathons that we do to build out our product. Um, and so some of it has been direct capital and direct funds. And other times it was those partnerships um, that ended up paying things for us or giving us services for free. <laughs> That's funny. You are, I am so much like you. I swear to you. Because like they tell me I can't, my team tell me I can't do the hackathons. I'm like, let's do a hackathon. Let's do it. Let's get people together. We're going to build the like, you know, they're like, Brian, that is not targeted work. We need, it's funny because I have cynics on my team, but they're very, very smart. So my co-founder, Aaron, he actually, it's funny because the people that are my co-founders are people that the people who I recruited to co-found a team recruited to be co-founders because so like, and, and like, and it's, and it's funny, it's, it's funny. So like, it's like, it's like, I am, I am good at hiring adjacent people. <laughs> so like my, my co-founder, Aaron, like, you know, we had, so my first ever hiring of an intern. I was like, oh, okay, we did this thing at the school. And we had like, um, I'm like, oh, hopefully I get somebody, two, three people apply, 90 people apply to my internship. Whoa. And this is when I was like 24 years old. And like, I'm just like some gay dude with paperwork. Like all these other startup companies got these banners and stuff. And like, and then I got this dude, I got this soft, I got this software consultant. It's like, oh, this dude passionate. I give him three hours of my time a week. Brian, yeah, call me your CTO. Um, and so like we had, so we go through all these resumes. He's like, why you got a lot? I was like, I know, it's just crazy. Um, <laughs> and, so, and so, um, and he goes through the stack and he's like, okay, here's the three people going to interview as a software engineer. And you should look at this guy. Cause when I talked to him, he understood business. He said, this is the only real startup here. And then like, he was with us for free for like a month and a half, two months. And then we gave him a trial. We was like, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? And then he was like, okay, I'll be a co-founder with y'all. And now it's two and a half years later. And now, you know, he's 23, I'm 28. It, you know, um, he he had his, he graduated from Washington University in St. Louis um, and he brought on his friend and now from his class. And now, and his friend is 25. So now we have this team, they're both software engineers and they they brought all, they brought all their friends and like, I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you as a, I'm a gay black man to lead the company, but if you look in it, it everybody's Asian. And like, I don't know. And, and, and like, and like, it, 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 it's, it's, and it's because like, they kept recruiting. Them, right? Like, I'll tell you, like, I, I'll tell you, like, and it's, and it's like, we have a lot of talented software engineers. So a lot of that is just like, they've been recruiting their friends. They like working together. And then they go off and get really good jobs. And we get to pitch that back to juniors that are, that are coming after them. And so like, I, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed and lucky. And like, let me tell you something. What I'm competing with, when I tell people, I'm like, I'm competing with them getting a job at Amazon as a software engineer. I got to keep them motivated and I got to keep putting them, I got to keep one, I got to keep giving them credit in the news and media. I got to keep giving them introduction. Like, you know, we met with SoftBank. I had to make sure my team members are on that. They keep them motivated. Keep When, I, when we get customers, they got to talk to our, our founding team. When we get giant partners, they got to talk to, to keep them motivated to chasing the ball with me because I'm competing against how great they could be right now and versus like what their uh, potential is. And I'm 28, I'm doing the same thing, right? If it's, a, if it's a down week for me, I'm like, man, you know, I could just go run that political campaign somewhere in America, you know? But like, you know, I don't wanna do that. I wanna build ED Rain. ED Rain also was my senior assignment in college. I looked at how to enroll and retain minority populations in higher education. So a lot of this, you know, when I go and talk to my professors, they're like, don't come back and talk. And I'm like, shoot, that's the target audience. I'll be right there. You ain't said a word. <laughs> like, you know, so like, and I keep, and I, and, and I keep doing that. And that's how my team has kind of been able to come together. It, it, it's, it's using the target audience to help itself. And then people come impressed with that. Aaron, like, you know, it, it's funny, Aaron, my co-founder, he can pass any test, any test ever, ever. We need a lending license because we we're trying to help some kids pay for first return deposit. He got that lending license. We need we need to solve that chicken and egg problem to get uh, listings in real estate. He became a real estate agent in two months, and we got the uh, access to MLS. So it, it's just it, it, you know, um, 
it, 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 it's, it's trusting people and also trusting the people around you to recruit people for you as well. If somebody right. says this might be a good fit for you, go and check that out and give them. And also sometimes it didn't work out. We get, we get people, when it, whenever we think about co-founders, we give them 90 days. 90 days. If, if you work out in 90 days, you're going to be with us. If you don't work out in 90 days, you're not with us. And if you're not willing to take that risk of giving us 90 days, it's not worth bringing you on this team anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, lots of insights there. So sadly, we're coming to a close, and I want to just make sure we address a couple of the questions um, in the Q&A. Um, let's see, the first one at the top is someone says, I'm brand new to this. Oh, Joanne says, I'm brand new to this. How do I get started? I've been in private practice for two years, but I need a lot of help still. So um, any thoughts around like just getting started and sort of, you know, keeping it going? Uh, it depends on what you, so like, I'm that little grant dude. So like, it depends on what your venture is in. So like 4.0 schools, they give you $400 to do like some little random pilot for three days. And then you get to qualify for the tiny fellowship. They give you $10,000 and like they give you $7,000 up front to do something. And then if you do that, they give you $3,000 on the follow on funding, all in grants. So like that's, mm -hmm. it, it depends on what you're trying to do because every sure. industry got something across America that's giving you money at the earliest stages. You just got to find it and you got to network. And you know what? Applying for stuff you ain't got no business applying to because you don't know where that feedback gonna come from and who was on that panel behind that and who was, who saw you. Because low key, people, I'm a everything I win, I try to become a judge for it too to give back to that organization. And then uh -huh. you low key peep stuff that is coming up. And then whenever like they make it, you like, yeah, I'm happy you made it. I, I low key voted for you. <laughs> like, you know, and, and and like that, that, you know, <laughs> you are, you are, because you know, I low key, I always try to stop the gatekeepers. I try to stop the gatekeepers. You know, I got friends that that we both won money. Like this is a girl named Michelle. She got this company called Demi Blue, Demi Vegan Nail Polish here in St. Louis. If if she if, first off, all the money in St. Louis, me and her both going for it. Like we all, <laughs> and, you know, it's funny. and it's funny because like we won all the same money. Oh, and she's won more money than me. And usually we're at events. Every event is me and her in the corner talking. Because we just everywhere together. And then like me and her are good for she my friend, she my homie. Like, you know, like and that and you create that little space and like you get to talk to the to, to job and like but also um whenever I get something like Camelback, I got rejected from Camelback Ventures in New Orleans. And I got this little resource report that it got they sent out that has like five hundred um investment groups and programs across America. Uh and she ain't never applied to Camelback. And I looked at it, and I was, it was a bunch of stuff for women. And, you know, today, we, there was a little fair for people that won this $1,000 at our alumni. And she was there. And I was like, hey, Michelle, you should look at this. She's like, what? I was like, this thing for women. Uh, and she was like, oh, okay. And then she was like, yeah, thank you. My Wednesday is about to be lit because that's my days I write for grants and money and investment. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Just want to say real quick, there's some stuff coming through the chat. So if you guys have a chance to look, they're directing some specific questions at you and also giving some love. So make sure you check out the chat before we come off. Go ahead, Mariah. First of all, I'm recruiting you two as friends. So <laughs> they're already. I just want to establish that now because like, I feel like Byron and I, we got to talk because I've been doing this grant thing. I've been doing this, put everybody else on peace. And what I will say is like, you're never going to be ready. You just got to start doing stuff. So my co-founder, she's very meticulous. She's the perfectionist of the group. And I'm the one that's like, let's go, let's go, showtime. And um, so what we do is like, I applied to so many different programs. Sit there and write on a piece of paper every, I, I do DEAI training, so you can probably tell, but write every identity you hold. You live in the Southeast, you queer, you non-binary, you a woman, you... Um, disabled, whatever your things are, you first generation. And I would literally Google first generation startup grant for, and, and like uh, apply to everything that you see and not only apply, this was something my operations and co-founder Lauren Mills had to tell me, save that in some sort of document because a lot of these questions are similar and then go back. This is just free game, y'all. Go back and retailor those questions. And as Byron was saying, there have been groups I was denied to. So I'm currently a Halcyon Fellow. Before that, I was denied from the fellowship. 
they only accept 3%. And most of the people in their cohorts have been denied two to three times. Same with tech stars. But what happened was someone on the panel really resonated with what I was saying. They told me, hey, you're not in this but we wanna recommend you for an entrepreneurship of DC program being run by Howard and GW. It was a free program teaching about customer discovery, was able to get a mentor who had gotten funding I was trying to get. Not only did it help me to get the access to that funding, but I came back and reapplied, now I'm a fellow. Don't let these no's get you down. There were times in the beginning when I would open my email and eat 10 no's for breakfast. <laughs> But like now, now I'm eating, you know, now I'm eating for real. And like, awesome. the last thing I'll say, I'm sorry, I know I'm long-winded, y'all. It's the neurodivergence. Like, do think outside the box. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I'm still a writer. I still write books. I still host shows. I still curate events. I've gotten funding from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. And it's funding for me to be a multidisciplinary artist. And I can cover whatever I need to cover in doing that. This UX, UI design sprints that I've been leading, I've been doing some of the graphic design and that's still a, another toolkit in my artistry belt now. I've been partnering with these design schools. So I've been getting paid grant funding to do that. There are grants for apprenticeships. There are grants for internships. It's not always you're going after the same funds as everybody else and work in collaboration with other folks. You're not my competition. Like even people in my vertical, we're collaborators because we're all trying to get it out here. And so it's like, share that information. If you see something and you know someone who's, you know, American, um, Na Native American, and you know that the, a founder like that, send them the stuff. And then when they see stuff for a non-binary weird artist, they gonna send it to me. You know, <laughs> it's, a, it's yes. a different date. And it sometimes is. it's about building those relationships like we already talked about early on. You don't know what the give back will be. You don't know what they're going on to do. That is true. Um, unfortunately, we are a little bit over time. I think you really answered one of the questions in the chat, which was how do you overcome mental trauma when facing rejection? You just keep going, right? You just ask for more grants, get up, dust yourself off and, and do the things that these fabulous founders on the screen have been doing and telling you to do. Um, I hate to end this. Um, I really do. Somebody said therapy and hiking. Yes, and yes, right? Get outside, let some sun hit your face. Um, so uh, Andrea, do you have a final thought that you would like to share um, on anything that we've been been chatting about? I, I could listen to Brian and Mariah all day. I'm, I'm loving Good it. Good too. <laughs> yeah, laughing my ass off over here. Uh, I know, I love I think you guys. The, the rejection question is really, really profound because this is a psycho like this is a psychology game. You're not, everyone here is smart enough. Everyone here is hardworking enough, but it's about like, are you taking care of yourself? Are you doing things that keep you? Cause like, dude, this is hard. This is hard stuff. So I always tell people I've been an entrepreneur for 12 years. I've built big companies, companies that failed, companies that grow, I've raised millions of dollars. And it's always you're your, your own worst person. So I started therapy. I heard hiking. I psychedelic saved me. <laughs> like I do psychedelic guided <laughs> therapy. I have like many, many friendships that water me. And, you know, I make time for things that feel good. Mm. Like, relationships and family and like you ain't seeing me staying up all night I sleep eight hours every night I drink water I so that's the secret to being an entrepreneur for a long time is you can't you can't die that's it that's my yeah that's, that's, that's kind that's of the my secret thing, to, like, you can't die. yeah that's a big old secret to everything right I mean you got to be taking care of yourself well-being if you don't have that you don't have anything you, that can't was, build a business. you saw that though you saw that it was like it was like struggle porn all the time. Yeah. I already had immigrant <laughs> struggle point yep. growing up. Like you can't, yep. you, you got to suffer to be successful. That, that's a lie. That's yeah, a lie. Look up Nat Ministry. That healed me as an entrepreneur. This is a black woman. She has this Instagram account called Nat Ministry. And it was like, rest, rest is resistance. Especially we got someone talking here about able-bodiedness. My sister's, you know, got chronic illness. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. we are not, we are not our startups. We are sacred. Suffer poor. Like we are sacred, sacred human beings. And yes. we forget that um, because yes. our companies are not who we are. 
Start I'm with. learning some stuff here myself. I'm writing down oh. nap ministry and I'm writing down stuff before because that is a new one for me. Um, listen, I, I really could sit here and talk to you guys like for the rest of the night. And I'm sure the people who are left on the call could absolutely do the same thing. We have to end. <laughs> I think we have to end. Do we have to end? Tell me, start out. Can we just keep going till like midnight? I mean, what's the deal? Go get a drink. Like, what are we doing? Okay, so I, I think we do have to end. Um, so I want to thank <laughs> Andrea. I want to thank Brian. And I want to thank Mariah for sharing so much with us. I mean, I, I got notes here on my questions because I'm learning right now, right? I've learned so much from all of you. Um, you guys reach out to them. They're on LinkedIn. Uh, you can find out about their businesses by going to their websites. Uh, people are saying very informative. You're getting loads and loads of love in the chat. And um you know, I, I didn't know any of you before I was asked to moderate, but I feel like I know you now a little bit better, and I hope we stay in touch. You guys reach out to start out if you want more programming like this. Um, we'd love to have you, and uh, people are, are typing in their, their URLs and all that. I see a woot woot, you know, all kinds of stuff is happening here. Um, no more software porn, okay? If you walk away from here, <laughs> with one giant pearl of wisdom. Stop the suffer porn. It's not good for you. It's not good for your business. It's not good for your friends and family either. Okay. So take care of yourselves. Be well. Come to more events because we love to see you. And uh, thank you all. I'm just, I'm going to wait for the Cindy Stop the Struggle Porn TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> just keep talking until they all leave. <laughs> I know I'm on a mission now. I got, you know, because people are suffering out there, you know, and you don't, it, the it, you know, they say, the the yeah. yeah, they say um, pain is not optional, but suffering is, right? Mm -hmm. And so we all gonna feel some pain in our lives, but don't keep it going with the suffering. Find a way I'm, out of that. I'm, look, that raindrop thing gonna happen. And then it's gonna be like, Cindy, Cindy Lamar, struggle point. We have to stop <laughs> I know I'm gonna put that on some and I'm gonna attribute to you, Andrea, because <laughs> you're gonna be a best selling TED Talk. <laughs> there we go. That's gonna be the name of my next chat. The name of Brian my next I already added you on LinkedIn. Let's uh, keep in touch, okay? Yes. Love you all. Most definitely. Yeah. Most yeah. definitely. Gotta, gotta leave it with we don't dream of labor. We are no, <laughs> we don't. Not here. Please don't. Please don't. All right. Bye bye, everybody.